tonight. We are so glad you're here on this beautiful day, and we welcome you to the McFadden Ward House. I'm Belle Morian. I'm the programming director here. Um, we're just delighted to have you and for this extraordinary opportunity to hear Beth Wees, Curator Emerita of the Metropolitan Museum from the American Wing. Um, I probably said this a million times this week, but I just can't believe Beth said yes. So <laughs> we are just so honored to have Beth here tonight. It's a true treat for our community. Um, but before we begin, I have a few things I'd like to share with you. Um, for the past several months, I think most everybody knows, we've been going through an electrical renovation here. And we're looking forward for the house to be open back to the community in the fall. And um, we can't wait to usher in just a really sparkling, happy holiday season with all our new lighting fixtures. <laughs> this is our last lecture for spring 2023. And so our McFadden Ward lecture series will resume in September with what we hope to be an interesting and diverse lineup for presenters. Um, I've been talking to some really interesting fellows lately, so we, we hope to have a treat for you next year as well. Um, also, I want you to mark your calendars in Sharpie because Jimmy Simmons is returning. Jimmy Simmons and friends are returning at Music with the McFadden's on Thursday, September 28th, and I know everybody loves to come to that. Um, I'm guilty of this always myself, so I will ask everybody to kindly turn off your cell phones, silence your cell phones at this time so you can enjoy the lecture. And at this point, I'd like to introduce our talented, accomplished, and wonderful executive director, Tony Chaveau. Thanks, Bill. I want to add my welcome uh, to all of you this evening for uh, this last lecture in the um, McFadden Ward House 2022-23 uh, lecture series. Uh, this year's series has been exceptional and it's due in no small part to, to Bell Morian's um, uh, diligent work and in, 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 uh, she researches everything and then she researches speakers and then she talks to everybody and decides who's, who, who will and will not uh, do, if you will. And, um, and then scheduling and then getting everybody here uh, is just um, a really her Herculean task and um, Belle does such a, a wonderful job of that. So thank you, Belle. Um, and likewise, as the, the, the prior lectures, I can assure you that you're in for a really special treat uh, this evening. Um, before we get to this evening's program, I want to uh, take a moment to recognize the Mamie McFadden Ward Heritage Foundation, um, uh, whose generosity funds all of our programming here at the museum, ensuring that all of our programs and activities are free and open to the public. Um, we have with us this evening uh, several members of the museum's board of directors who deserve your recognition and thanks. Um, Lane uh, Wilson is with us. Lane, wave. Mm -hmm. uh, Jean Ann Lisi. Jean Ann. Um, Martha Hicks is with us. There's, there's Martha. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ida McFadden Powell, who is the uh, Vice President Emerita of the Board of Directors. Ida. Mm -hmm. I should also note that uh, the McFadden family is really well represented uh, here this evening. In addition to Ida and Elaine and uh, Jean Ann, I want to welcome uh, Rosine Wilson Hall. Rosine. There she is. And Rachel Wilson Madanov. It's been said that donning a piece of jewelry is a bid to be a better self. Wearing it affirms you have become one. Marriages, deaths, grand balls, coronations, romantic dates, even the daily preparation for a job all look to the magic that jewelry works. Throughout history, uh, humans have adorned themselves in fascinating and varied ways, arguably making jewelry the oldest art form predating cave painting by tens of thousands of years. Uh, this evening's speaker was trained as an art historian at Smith College 
and in the Williams College graduate program uh, in the history of art and was invited to join the staff of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York uh, at the, in their American wing to catalog its collection of early American silver, which was published in 2013. From there, she went on to become the Ruth Bigelow Riston Curator of American Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan, where for 20 years she oversaw the Met's magnificent collections of American silver and jewelry. To help us see jewelry as works of art and also as distinct cultural markers, please welcome Beth Carver Wees. Beth. Thank you, Tony. Ooh, I'm squeaking. Oh, let's move that. Yeah. How's that? All right, can you all hear me? Great. Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Belle, and thank you, everyone, who has greeted my husband, Dustin, and me with such warmth and uh, hospitality. We feel very um, well cared for, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. We've been to Houston once or twice, but never to Beaumont, so it's been a great um, adventure coming out here, and uh, I hope I'll be able to uh, show you some nice jewelry. I'm going to begin my lecture um, with a quote, and you'll understand in just a moment where it's coming from. Let's see. Oops. There we go. This is a quote. Before a jeweler's window in St. Mark's Square, Venice, an American tourist of means listened to his wife. Dear, please buy me that platinum ring, the one with a ruby in it. I do so want to take home a typical souvenir of Venice, <laughs> one that I may keep always, and whenever I look at it, be reminded of moonlit nights and gondoliers. And this is, uh, I'm, I'm cutting into my quote to say, memories that jewelry hold, I think, are so important. Where you got it, who owned it before you, what, you know, what occasion. Um, so whatever you're wearing today, think about that. The man succumbed, but being a jeweler himself, he examined the ring closely and learned that it was a product of Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> the platinum had been refined and the setting made there in one of the city's some 200 jewelry factories. <clears throat> Excuse me. But he didn't tell his wife. He allowed her to keep on dreaming of her Venetian souvenir. <laughs> Now, this charming story, which first appeared in the Newark Evening News on January the 9th, 1917, was retold by curator Ulysses Grant Dietz in the catalog for the exhibition, The Glitter and the Gold, Fashioning America's Jewelry, which he uh, co-organized with Janet Zapata in 1997 at the Newark Museum. And if you can get hold of the catalog, it's, it's really very instructive. As Ulysses noted in the catalog, this story underscores two little-known facts. First, that in its heyday, Newark, New Jersey was the capital of the American fine jewelry industry. And second, that jewelry manufactured in Newark, Newark was of sufficient quality to achieve an international market. How American jewelry production grew and prospered, what it looked like, who owned it, who made it. These are some of the topics that I'd like to cover with you uh, this evening. Great. My lecture takes as, it, as its template an exhibition I curated in 2019 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that I called, as I'm calling the lecture, Jewelry for America. <coughs> Pardon me. Drawn, uh, drawn entirely from five of the Met's 17 curatorial departments, it featured more than 100 works, primarily jewelry, but as you can see here, also paintings, books, and works on paper that helped to chronicle the evolution of jewelry worn by Americans from the 18th century to the present day. The first section, Sentimental Journey, examines some of the earliest jewelry worn in this country, much of it imported, and often filled with those memories I mentioned and, and certain kind of sentiment or nos nostalgia. In the second section, American Industry, we witnessed the beginnings of domestic jewelry manufacturing, uh, which was propelled by 19th century industrialization, you always have to look at what's going on in the world, and the economic growth of our country. 
The 1867 discovery of diamond deposits in South Africa, which coincided with increased prosperity and protective tariffs. And those tariffs were uh, important because they encouraged, uh, encouraged, excuse me, encouraged American manufacturing. Those were the stories behind uh, the section three called fin de siècle brilliance, diamonds. Uh, and the fourth and largest section featured American Art Nouveau and arts and crafts jewelry, which was produced at a time when the natural world, flowers, animals, and such, as well as historical precedents, reigned supreme. And then finally, in uh, creativity and innovation, we find avant-garde artists re reassessing the function of jewelry, as well as the materials from which it was made. And in that section, we'll also see a little bit of costume jewelry. <clears throat> this is your allergies, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the earliest jewelry owned and worn in America was often related to courtship and marriage or to death and mourning. And mourning rings carried particular significance during the 17th and 18th centuries when colonists dealt frequently with the reality of death. Following English and continental traditions, these rings were often presented to relatives and close friends of the deceased at the funeral. One of the earliest mourning rings in the Metz collection is the gold and black enameled example on the right with glass in the shape of a coffin. And that underneath that coffin is a lock of hair. Okay. And the ring bears two memorial inscriptions. You can see bits of one on the outside in gold lettering on black enamel. And it reads, Cat de Peister, Catherine de Peister, OB, so died, the 8th of December, 1733, aged 80, uh, excuse me, 69. And then on the inside, maybe you can see it sort of, some scrapings in there, <clears throat> is an inscription commemorating her husband, Abraham de Peister, who served as both mayor of New York City and the governor of New York State. The ring on the left is a, a memorial ring honoring George Washington, I'm sure you recognize him, who died on the 14th of December, 1799. And it's a very simple, wide gold band, but it's set with an, enga engraved, portra an engraved portrait by the artist Charles Fevre de saint memin sometimes you hear it, saint memin uh, who immigrated to America during the French Revolution and became a well-known portrait engraver. Uh, these are often very beautiful portraits in um, profile. Several of these rings are actually documented in Washington's will, where he left them to members of his family and close friends, uh, quote, not for their intrinsic value, but as mementos of my, my esteem and regard. So again, this issue of memory and um, how you remember an individual. Now, I know the idea of human hair might uh, be off-putting to some of you, but um, it figures frequently in memorial lockets and brooches as a wearable remembrance of, um, the, of a loved one. And uh, the brooch on the left with braided hair, you can see it sort of um, tucked under, a, again, a crystal, set beneath a crystal face, is engraved on its reverse in memory of 39-year-old Charles, 39 Charles T. Evans, who died at sea in 1852. It has a classic border of tiny pearls and faceted jet. And jet, as you may know, is often associated with mourning jewelry. But did you know, this was news to me, uh, that hair jewelry was also a do-it-yourself industry. The bracelet on the right consists of 12 barrel-shaped gold links, 10 of them engraved with the first initials of the children of Catherine and Frederick Havemeyer, and then the first and last barrels are inscribed mother and father. And I'm laughing, you can't see it here, but the only gray hair is mother. <laughs> <laughs> so designs of this type were illustrated in such how-to manuals as Mark Campbell's Self-Instructor in the Art of Hair Work. And I'm showing you a plate from that book. Uh, it was published in New York in 1867. You often get hair jewelry, also just the hair, um, earrings and necklaces, bracelets. Uh, it's, it's really pretty fascinating. And it wasn't only um, dedicated to or devoted to mourning. It was also sometimes given as gifts to uh, uh, dear ones, as a token of love or devotion. Uh, you also frequently find it on the back of a portrait miniature, the person portrayed. You see the hair of, of that individual. 
Now, of course, not all early jewelry worn in colonial America uh, was related to death and mourning. More celebratory, for example, is this diamond engagement ring, which was presented to Judith Cromelin by Samuel Verplank in 1760. And there's a portrait of Samuel on the left from 1771 by John Singleton Copley, the great Boston portraitist. The gold ring is probably English, and it features a bez bezel set cushion-shaped diamond in the center, surrounded by 12 smaller rose-cut diamonds. In 1761, Samuel married his cousin, Judith Cromelin, uh, in Amsterdam, where he had been studying banking under his uncle, her father. And two years later, the couple moved to Manhattan and settled into the Verplank family home on Wall Street, uh, down in Lower Manhattan. And it's shown here on the right in 1789, next door to Federal Hall. So the house is, let's see if I can make this work. Um, this is their house right here. We tend to think about jewelry intended for women. <clears throat> Pardon me, but of course men have worn jewelry forever um, as well. And uh, in colonial and federal, federal America, male jewelry was mainly limited to buttons, buckles, rings, and badges. I'm showing here a, a beautiful portrait, I think, at the, also at the Met, by Gilbert Stewart. Uh, and it's a portrait of Matthew Clarkson, who was a distinguished soldier and politician. And he's wearing uh, on his lapel uh, the Society of Cincinnati badge on a blue and white grosgrain ribbon. I'm sure it shall be preserved. And so this is made of shell, which is a little easier to cut than um, stone. But on the left, I'm showing you a very naturalistic onyx cameo made of on banded onyx cut around seven, uh, excuse me, 1860 by the German-born American cameo carver Louis Zollner and set into a gold and diamond mount. And it portrays a man called Jeremiah Finch, who was a New York State lumber merchant uh, in whose family it descended. So when it came to the Met, uh, it had already descended in the family, in one family, which provenance is really great. If you know who owns something, it, it makes a big difference. Zollner used a banded black and white onyx stone to achieve a light colored portrait against a dark ground. If, if you know a, what a banded stone looks like, the cameo carver had to cut through one layer to reveal another, and sometimes you have three or four colors in a stone. And I really love this cameo. I love how the carver captured the texture of his facial hair and even the bags under his eyes. You see that? <laughs> Now, this is the American industry, section two. Over the course of the 19th century, <clears throat> a dedicated jewelry industry took shape in America. Foreign-made uh, jewelry and its component materials continued to be imported for sale as they are today. But early in the century, a domestic industry took root and flourished. And one of the most popular imported materials was coral, uh, which since antiquity was believed to possess talismanic powers. And in fact, children such as little Emma Homan, uh, portrayed in this 1844 painting by John Bradley, wore strands of coral beads to protect her from um, uh, evil, and, excuse me, to protect her illness and to ward off evil spirits. And she even has a pair of matching uh, coral bracelets. Its popularity, however, was not restricted simply to children. In 1865, the Paris correspondent for the Boston Transcript reported, quote, all ornaments of coral are much in fashion. So this is the mid-19th uh, century. And I'm showing you what we call a demi parure or half set on the left, um, is made of coral, uh, flower, floral um, sprays in coral mounted in gold. And this coral would have been imported from Naples, Italy, which was the center of the coral trade. Italy was always the center of cameo carving. This set is unmarked. But it was retailed in America. We know that because it retains its original box, which is imprinted Tiffany and Company, 550 Broadway, 552 New York, where the firm was located between 1854 and 1870. So, you know, do save those boxes if you ever buy a piece or inherit a piece of, of uh, jewelry with its original box, because the box documents its history, its location, where it was made, and even can, uh, can add to its value. Coral features as well in these early 20th century Zuni bead necklaces, made as you can see from turquoise 
which of course was mined in the southwest, coral, which was, as we've just seen, imported from the Mediterranean, and small shells. And I find these really powerful uh, necklaces. They originally belonged to a man called Henry Chi Dodge, who was the last official head chief of the Navajo tribe from 1884 until 1910. And you know, for many um, of the Native American um, uh, tribes, peoples, the meaning of jewelry can be quite spiritual as well as aesthetic. Now, as we have already seen, Newark, New Jersey was home to many of America's 19th century jewelry manufactories. Beginning in 1801, the Newark industry grew and prospered until its demise with the stock market crash of 1929. So over a century, it was really the center of American jewelry manufacturing. And by the 1870s, it had developed into a $5 million a year industry. The city's 200 or more factories manufactured everything from gold collar buttons to diamond brooches, um, which were distributed to a worldwide clientele, to Texas, to Venice, you know, all over the country. And this success uh, was again supported by several factors, uh, economic and um, uh, political and manufacturing. Several factors included the introduction of steam-powered machinery, uh, the 1849 California gold rush, and the 1859 discovery in, in, of silver in Nevada's Comstock Lode, as well as the growth of the Transcontinental Railroad, which transported gold and silver from the Western mines directly to the Newark factories. And what I'm showing you now are just a few examples of Newark jewelry. Once you've heard this, and if you look up The Glitter and the Gold, the book um, uh, that I mentioned earlier, you'll find many, many firms you've never heard of, but they would have been made in Newark and then distributed around the country to be sold at your local jewelry store. So on the top is a um, wonderful link bracelet dating from the 1880s, made by the Newark firm of A.J. Hedges and Company. And they may, had their own patented process for mottling different colors of gold. And this was a technique that was inspired by Japanese metalwork. Um, and so they have these little multicolored gold squares imitating uh, squares of checked cloth joined together by tiny gold pins. Can you see those? Yeah. And then, of course, set, you had to have a little bling, set with two sapphires and a single diamond. These are um, Montana sapphires, bright blue Montana sapphires. And it's a very clever design and surprisingly forward-looking, I think, for the 1870s, 1880s. I think I might have guessed 1950s or something. I don't know what I would have guessed. Below on the right is a gold and enamel watch pin made around 1900 by Riker Brothers. And it's um, interesting how it's constructed. It's two separate layers riveted together. The front section depicts a heron amidst gem-set cattails and lily pads in gold. And then the back portrays a brilliantly colored sunset in a technique called plique a jour enamel. And Riker Brothers was one of the very few American firms that undertook this challenging technique in which the cells of color have a frame but no backing, um, which allows the light to shine through. Another watch pin on the lower left is marked by the Newark firm of Alling and Company, and it's made of 14 karat gold, which is a co very common American um, carat, and uh, also diamonds. And it features a female head in profile, very much in the Art Nouveau style of the turn of the 20th century. You'll be seeing this piece again um, in just a moment. As with most artistic production, political and economic developments have often influenced uh, jewelry manufacturing. And thanks to the Patent Act, Patent Act of 1790, for instance, American jewelers were able to safeguard their new inventions. This was completely new that you could patent uh, you know, your discovery. In 1836, Charles Goodyear invented a process to harden rubber by treating it with sulfur at high temperatures. He called this new substance vulcanite, and he patented it in 1844. Vulcanite became a very popular substitute for more expensive materials such as tortoiseshell or jet. And I'm showing you here a vulcanite um, hair comb with an applied shade on the top. This is basically rubber. Uh, it's marked and dated on its reverse. Uh, 1851, Charles Goodyear. And I just found this on, on uh, you know, Google, um, but I, I was interested to see how it looked in, in here. 
Another particularly ingenious uh, innovation of the 1870s were snap-on covers for diamond drop earrings. Here, spherical hinged gold covers, enameled in black, protected and concealed the old mine-cut diamonds. And among the patents for such devices, I'm showing you on the right, was improvement in earring covers, patented by Anthony Hessels on September the 10th, 1878. And in the text that accompanies this, um, this patent, uh, he explained, quote, ladies are thereby enabled to wear diamond earrings without exposing them on the streets <laughs> and of removing the covers whenever it is desired to show the diamonds. I, I think they're great, and I, I wouldn't mind having something like that today. One of the most prolific American uh, producers of silver jewelry, flatware, and hollowware was the Gorham Manufacturing Company of Providence, Rhode Island. Founded in 1831 by Jabez Gorham, at first for the production of coin silver spoons, by the 1870s and 80s, the firm was creating far more sophisticated items. And according to this um, 1890 advertisement, the Gore Manufacturing Company have in their stock of silver jewelry the largest assortment and greatest variety of designs in the country. All of these ads have a great deal of hype. <laughs> and then at lower on you see um, the ablest artists are employed in constantly adding attractive novelties of every description to this line of goods. Well, who could refute that claim when you uh, encounter this silver octopus chatelaine? It is stamped with Gorham's date mark for 1887, pattern number 145, and the word sterling. So we know it's sterling silver. And uh, this charming octopus has red glass eyes with black pupils and eight chains with coin silver clasps. So what was it? It was essentially a housekeeper's toolkit. <clears throat> the clasps would have held such attachments as a watch, scissors, button hook, notepad, scent bottle, pocket knife, um, as you see illustrated in this period photograph for, from the Gorham archives. And then how, how you wore it, you hooked that little V at the back, you just hooked that um, onto your skirt waist. And I had to put it, if any of you are unfamiliar with chatelaines, do you, do you recognize Mrs., uh, Mrs. Hughes from Downton Abbey? She wore a chatelaine, and then an anonymous woman, but really stocked chatelaine uh, on the right. Okay. In section three, we celebrated the discovery of diamond deposits in South Africa in 1867, and the passion for dazzling diamond encrusted adornment um, took off. And it really coincided with more um, growing prosperity. This was after the Civil War. Uh, also protective tariffs that were instituted that encouraged American manufacturing, and also with in, uh, improved techniques in faceting uh, and setting gemstones. So it, it was just a, a great moment for diamond jewelry. And uh, I'm showing you here one of the Met's earliest examples of jewelry marked by Tiffany and Company. It's a uh, late 19th century diamond corsage piece, and it's fashioned as a cascade of five flowers of diminishing size. It's, it's uh, flexible, so you could you know, wear it straight down or curved, but you could also, um, let's see, the three largest uh, flowers unscrew from the frame, and they can be attached to separate gold findings, so you could wear them as, as brooches, as individual pins. The diamonds here are set into oxidized silver. All that black is actually silver, uh, but on a gold backing. And this was a practice called silver topped gold, which was especially popular in the 18th and 19th centuries because the whiteness of silver was thought to better suit the brilliance of diamonds than a gold mount. Um, and uh, it wasn't until about 1900 that platinum began to, to be, see more use in jewelry, and that's what we're more used to in the 20th century, diamonds set into platinum, although platinum has been known since antiquity. Tiffany & Company is the best known American jeweler, I'm sure, but it was never the only game in town. By the 19-teens, Manhattan's Fifth Avenue bustled with upscale jewelry houses, competing both amongst themselves and with imported foreign brands. And one of the lesser known but very highly regarded of these um, was the firm called Dreiser & Company, which was founded in 1868 by Russian immigrants, Jacob and Gittel Dreiser, 
who in, arrived in New York uh, already with a, an extensive knowledge of precious gems. And their son, uh, Michael, would later become a leading expert on natural pearls. We'll talk about pearls in just a moment. In Dreiser's elegant Fifth Avenue showroom, modeled after a French salon, tea was served each afternoon to clients such as the actress Sarah Bernhardt, the dowager Mrs. Astor, First Lady Ida McKinley, and uh, Queen Elizabeth of Belgium. And unfortunately, both um, uh, Jacob and Michael um, Dreiser died in the 1920s, so the firm was fairly short-lived. One of my favorite acquisitions for the Met um, is this diamond and natural pearl necklace by Dreiser, which I was able to acquire in 2012. And it has that cool elegance that really epitomizes the garland style that became so popular um, in the Edwardian, uh, in Edwardian England and Belle Epoque France around the turn of the 20th century. This is, so it's a platinum necklace set with approximately 22.5 carats of diamonds accented with 16 natural gray pearls. And um, I'm probably telling you something you already know, but natural pearls are very rare and still quite expensive since they occur essentially by accident. When an irritant um, enters the shell of a, mo a mollusk, usually an oyster, and uh, it takes a so because of that, it takes a very long time to acquire a sufficient number of matching pearls um, matched in shape, in size, in color, in luster. In fact, I've read that only about one in 10,000 wild oysters will yield a pearl. So you can just imagine, you see those long strands of pearls in, in Renaissance paintings, how long it took uh, to collect them. Uh, it, it, it did change um, in the early 20th century when Miki Moto received the first patent on jewels, including a diamond bow brooch, uh, a watch, a diamond watch, earrings, and rings, uh, which I have one to show you uh, um, here. You'll see more in the exhibition. Uh, but this is a stunning diamond and pearl, three pearl ring, two white pearls in the center, a uh, pink pearl uh, on her right hand. And this ring is marked plat, P-L-A-T, for platinum, uh, and also Simon, S-Y-M-A-N, for the jewelry firm of Simon Brothers, which I believe was in Denver, so that suggests that they were outsourcing their jewelry to, um, well, maybe it was bought in Denver, I don't know. Uh, but um, the other ring I'm showing you here, perhaps not as valuable as diamonds and pearls, but certainly deeply meaningful to Mimi, is her gold wedding band, uh, which is engraved inside C-E-W to M-L-M, -M, 52119, given to her by Carol E. Ward to Mamie Louise McFadden on May 21, 1919, the date of their marriage. It was supplied, uh, the, I guess the, where's um, Victoria? I think the invoice survives. You know that it's, is that right? Where is she? Yes. <laughs> Anyhow, um, by Arthur A. Everett's co uh, company in Dallas, which advertised itself as, quote, one of the most elegant jewelry establishments in America. The um, McFadden Ward House also uh, owns two, two, a few other pieces of jewelry um, that belong to the family, to, including two lorgnettes or opera glasses. And um, the pair I'm showing you here uh, is set with many small diamonds. I'm showing it to you both closed in the center and open, so the, the glasses had to fold twice to fit into that um, little case. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Victoria tells me that it came from the New York jewelry firm of Charles H. Bal Barman, sorry, Barnum, with whom Mary, Mamie's aunt, Weda Caldwell Watt, was working on a gift for Mamie's mother, uh, Ida Caldwell McFadden. And the drawing on the left is unsigned, so we can't prove it, but it appears to be a preliminary design, which um, was then slightly altered for the final product. And this is a customary process, even today, that the jeweler provides designs to the client to consider, discuss, and then the jewel, the jewel is altered as requested. The, the, excuse me, the um, drawing is inscribed on the lower left, however, 114 diamonds and 19 baguettes. And baguettes are the sort of thin rectangular diamonds. So you can see it's not exactly the same, but clearly it was on its way uh, in the drawing. The second lorgnette is made of 14 karat gold, again, an American gold um, uh, um, 
parrot with enamel and diamonds. And it appears to have been made by one of the Newark firms, Alling and Company, which was founded in 1843. One of Alling's specialties was jewelry that incorporated an enameled and bejeweled uh, female head in profile, uh, as you see on the brooch I showed you earlier and on the lorgnette. It looks like it's probably from the same firm. We don't. It's not marked uh, with, the, with the maker, so we can't tell. But uh, it made me think about a uh, family in Beaumont, Texas, owning jewelry from Newark, New Jersey, which really speaks to um, what we said, said earlier, that uh, Newark had very wide distribution in its um, jewelry. So made it all the way to Texas. Oh, excuse me. The family also owned a gold mesh bag made by Carter Guff and Company, one of Newark's oldest jewelry manufacturers. And uh, by the earliest, early 20th century, this was a very well-established firm. And it advertised, among other things, lorgnettes, vanity cases, and gold mesh bags. We don't really see these anymore, and I've been wondering how much you could carry in there. It's you know, pretty small, but uh, really quite wonderful. Oh, excuse me, too far. All right, I'd like to show you another um, uh, diamond and platinum lorgnette. This, this is in the Mets collection, and it was made by Cartier New York. Can you make that out on the right? Uh, Cartier New York. And when you see Cartier jewelry, it would also often say Cartier New York, Cartier Paris, Cartier London. Um, anyhow, this one belonged to Jenny Dwight Bliss, whose monogram, uh, you probably can't make it out, but whose monogram in script is at on the bridge of the glasses. And both Jenny and her daughter, the philanthropist Susan Dwight Bliss, love diamonds, and they also love snakes. So as you can see, um, the eyepieces here are you know, curled snakes. And do not miss the two sets of lenses for a woman of a certain age, the seeing lenses and the looking lenses, right? Preeminent jewelry houses such as Cartier, Tiffany, and Dreiser were joined in the 1920s and 30s by a younger generation of luxury jewelers, uh, including Raymond Yard, who is pictured there on the left, who opened uh, his shop in 1922 after a 20-year career working for Marcus and Company, another um, New York jewelry firm I'll mention shortly. Yard's uh, insistence upon exceptional designs, superb materials, and excellent craftsmanship won him many uh, elite clients, including members of the Rockefeller, DuPont, Vanderbilt, and Woolworth families, as well as Hollywood stars. You know, the red carpet, I don't know when it started, but Hollywood stars have always loved jewels. Between 1928 and 1931, he created a series of charming rabbit brooches, each slightly different, and here um, in the Mets collection, uh, a beautiful example with pave set uh, Pave set um, rabbit where, with a diamond jacket, calibre cut ruby pants with black enamel, sapphire, and emerald trim. <laughs> and he carries a black enamel tray holding diamond glasses, and, art and he carries an articula articulated diamond ice bucket. It does swim. Um, ho carry it holding a champagne bottle. And that um, it amuses me uh, that these rabbit waiters served alcohol during Prohibition, which... <laughs> Much sure, must surely have also amused car, uh, Yard's uh, high society clientele. Another American firm was founded by the Italian-born Duke Fulco di Verdura, who began his career under the tutelage of Coco Chanel in Paris. And Verdura moved to New York, or excuse me, to the United States in 1934, and in 1939 he opened his first shop on New, York, New York's Fifth Avenue. Um, and it was financed by his friends, Cole Porter and Vincent Astor. So that was good friends to have. <coughs> his iconic um, Maltese cuff bracelets were first made for Sh Coco Chanel in the 1930s. Um, did I go too far? I think I did. We'll go back. Yeah, here they are. Um, so they were made of white baked enamel um, and then set with these uh, uh, Maltese cuffs. And there you see on the right, Verdura and Coco Chanel um, looking at her original pair. His signature cuff was much imitated, uh, including by his, another good friend, the costume jeweler, jeweler Kenneth J. Lane. Um, and on the left, you see uh, an ivory cuff that belongs to the Met, which is set with 
sapphires, diamonds, pearls, and a central emerald. And that was donated to the museum in 2005 by um, a great benefactor to the Met, Mrs. Charles Reitzman. Um, and the costume cuffs belonged to originally to Lauren Bacall. Another well-known American jeweler, David Webb, was born in Asheville, North Carolina, and opened shop in New York City in 1948. And among his best-known designs are the bold and eclectic enameled animals, the so-called enamel jungle, that he began to create in 1957. His iconic ruby-eyed enameled and diamond-set zebra bracelet, first designed in 1963, was fe featured in this famous photograph by Irving Penn, for Vogue magazine, whose then editor, Diana Vreeland, owned a zebra bracelet of her own. There she is, um, which you see here in uh, this wonderful photograph of her uh, from 1968 with fashion icon CZ Guest and Truman Capote. Photographs are also a great way to learn how jewelry was worn, what it looked like. <laughs> The Met's richest holdings in American jewelry, dating from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, constituted section four of the exhibition. Uh, and in the 1870s, the fledgling Metropolitan Museum was founded in 1870, acquired a collection of Cypriot antiquities amassed by the American consul to Cyprus, <clears throat> pardon me, Luigi Palma di Cesnola, who in 1879, almost 10 years later, would become the museum's first director. At the site of Curium, Chesnola discovered a group of tombs and a significant quantity of jewelry that he somewhat fallaciously publicized as the Corian treasure. And among the gold jewelry he acquired was this fifth century BC gold bracelet with lion head finials and a copper core. Now this is a design we've seen, we see today, right? Well, Chesnola happened to be friends with Charles L. Tiffany, <coughs> who in 1837 had founded Tiffany and Company. And that's um, Charles Tiffany on the left, I love this photo, in a top hat um, at his 15 Union Square shop around 1900. And check out the way the silver was displayed. I don't see any jewelry, but that's all right. <laughs> really stuffed in there. In August of 1877, Chesnola arranged for Tiffany and Company to become sole agents for the reproduction of works of art belonging to the Met. And the first objects selected for reproduction were 20 pieces of jewelry from the Curium collection, including the fifth century BC Cypriot bracelet uh, that we just saw, which served as the model for the bracelet on the right. The Tiffany Company uh, replicas were proudly displayed at the 1878 Paris Exposition Universelle to immediate and enthusiastic acclaim. And these, uh, these early World's Fairs were an important venue for American jewelers to show their goods to the world. Although remarkably similar to the original, the Tiffany copy was fashioned as a hollow tube with an invisible spring at the bottom. Uh, so you could just twist it to put it on. And it also, of course, is marked by Tiffany and Company um, 18 for 18 karat gold, a higher karat gold. And I'd long wanted to uh, acquire one of these for the Met since we had the Korean um, treasure. Uh, and happily, it was a gift, gift to us in 2018. One of Tiffany and Company's most talented 19th century artists was G. Paulding Farnham, who designed this gem set orchid brooch still in its original Tiffany blue velvet box. And it is one of a small group of orchids that Farnham uh, created for Tiffany and Company's display at the 1889 Paris Exposition Universelle. So several years later, but they were back in Paris. Um, and these orchids helped to secure a gold medal in jewelry for Tiffany, the first such uh, award ever won by an American firm at a, at a World's Fair. Oh, sorry, went too far. Uh, the cultivation of exotic orchids at that time was highly fashionable. And I love the fact that Tiffany, the Tiffany workshop kept um, actual specimens on hand for the designers, as well as many volumes of illustrated books, just to ensure uh, botanical accuracy. And I'm showing you here on the left an actual um, one of these orchids. 
It was not until the death of Charles Tiffany in 1902 that his son, Louis C. Tiffany, began to exhibit his own jewelry designs. <coughs> Louis, often called Louis Comfort Tiffany, was a true polymath. He was a painter, a glass and ceramics artist, enamelist, metal worker, and interior designer. And his jewelry always manifests his love affair with nature, which is evident in this astonishing hair ornament, uh, which um, is made up of tiny black opals, those little shimmery blue things are black opals, white enameled florets, red garnets, and green demantoid garnets, all set into a delicate um, mass of silver wire, which you can see on the back, to create a Queen Anne's lace blossom in full bloom. And this hair ornament was one of three iterations of um, Queen Anne's lace that Tiffany exhibited at the St. Louis Exposition, St. Louis World's Fair, in 1904. You know, partially open, more open, and then the full bloom here. It's amazing, and you'd need a lot of hair to hold that. <laughs> it's big. Oops. Among Tiffany's New York competitors was a firm called Marcus & Company, founded around 1892 by German immigrant Hermann Marcus. And uh, I have to say, Marcus's work is consistently well-designed, meticulously crafted, even on the reverse. And I'm showing you here on the left um, a charming insect form gold brooch set with a large natural pearl and demantoid garnets. Demantoids are green. Uh, and it's Mark J&M for an early iteration of the firm called Jacques and Marcus. On the right, uh, for about 1900, is a brooch featuring a large peridot accompanied by diamonds, enamel, and pearls, and reflecting an interest the firm had in Indian jewelry. They actually traveled to India in the 19th century and came back with um, jewelry and ideas. And in the center, one of my favorite acquisitions, a plique jour brooch fashioned as a cluster of sweet peas set with diamonds and pendant conch pearls. Plique à jour, again, is that technique by which you had a frame but no backing, so it's like stained glass. How they made this, I cannot tell you. The way the, the petals um, turn in and out, it's just quite remarkable. Now, our research on Marcus and company led me to an archive of thousands of small dra drawings housed at the Rauner, collect, excuse me, Rauner Special Collections Library at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. And um, Dustin and I went to visit, and we found designs for all of our pieces, as well as many, many, many more. There are thousands of these. And most of the drawings are inscribed, as you can see, with a code or inventory number, sometimes with other helpful information, a date or a name, um, that uh, my colleague and I are gradually deciphering. I was very happy to be able to negotiate with the Rauner Library and the Met Library um, to digitize these drawings. So the collection is now available online for your browsing pleasure. Um, it, uh, you just have to go to Rauner Library, Jacques and Marcus, and you'll find the drawings. And um, I'm going to uh, give a little um, commercial break here to say that my colleague, Sheila Smithy, and I are working on a book about this firm, which is scheduled to be published in the fall of 2024. So if you're tempted by their jewels, um, stay tuned. In this same section of the exhibition, <clears throat> pardon me, we featured several highly talented women, including the remarkable Marie Zimmerman, who was born in Brooklyn in 1879, studied at both Pratt Institute and the Art Students League in New York. She was a frequent visitor to the Metropolitan Museum, uh, where she was inspired by the Greek, Egyptian, and Far Eastern galleries. And it's interesting, she was trained in painting and sculpting at these schools, but she was primarily a metal worker. She claimed to make everything from tiaras to tombstones. And I show you her here in her studio at the National Arts Club. Maybe some of you have been to the National Arts Club in New York around 1926, where she had a studio and she also lived. In 19, uh, excuse me, in 2011, the Met acquired two necklaces and a brooch by Zimmerman, each reflecting her assimilation of historical styles and amazing creativity, really extraordinary. In the necklace on the upper right, uh, she's channeling the Renaissance jeweler's aesthetic of alternating um, large creamy pearls with inset rectangular gemstones. Here she's using deep green tourmalines and red garnets. 
But in the, on the inside, if you can see it, she um, uses a, a, the, uh, an Egyptian palette of green and blue enamels and stylized lotus blossoms. Okay. And then there's this really unusual brooch, uh, which has rubies, sapphires, emeralds, and green tourmalines all faceted to enhance their sparkle, um, which add a refinement to the rather delicate, very large central black opal. And the corner um, stones, with, which is a stone called shatakite, don't ask me, but it's somehow related to malachite and all those, um, that family of stones. But then on the back, I love this, she used matte enamels to complement the earthy tones of the back of the natural opal. So what we see in the center here that's the back of this opal. And so she picked up those colors um, with uh, enamels. It was owned by a woman called Dr. Connie M. Guyon, who was a pioneering f uh, female physician in New York City and a friend of Zimmerman's. And I love that she's wearing it in this uh, photo from the 1960s with some of her male colleagues. <laughs> and finally, creativity and innovation. The International Exhibition of Modern Jewelry, which was held at London's Goldsmiths Hall in 1961, was truly a watershed for contemporary jewelers. Quote, cheap materials need not mean artistic insignificance. That was a quote from the exhibition curator, Graham Hughes. Cheap materials need not mean artistic insignificance. And so we see an artist such as Alexander Calder creating jewelry out of twisted brass wire as in the monogram DM on the, on the right, which he made around 1950 for Dorothy Miller, Dorothy Canning Miller, who was one of the first female curators uh, in New York's Museum of Modern Art. And uh, during his lifetime, Calder produced some 1,800 pieces of really highly individualistic wire jewelry, usually made for family and friends, but drawing inspiration from a wide range of cultures, including African and Native American sources. And although we don't absolutely know the source for the massive silver necklace on the left, you can see how big it is, it appears to reference either bones or feathers. His jewelry is quite amazing. The Cuban-born Jamaican-American artist, Will, uh, excuse me, Will Smith, Art Smith, sorry, that was a <laughs> Art Smith, was influenced by African jewelry and biomorphism, which was a style that evoked organic forms. And I'm showing you two of his iconic bracelets, the modern cuff on the left and the lava bracelet on the right, which really um, epitomized the bold asymmetry and progressive spirit of his designs. These are from the 1940s. Basically, he was transforming copper and brass into pieces of wearable sculpture. They could be, you know, they could sit on a shelf as a piece of sculpture. Do you recognize her? This is Elsa Peretti, who was a high fashion model in the early 1970s. But she began making jewelry for the American designer Halston, for whom she also modeled. And in 1974, she joined Tiffany and Company, where her organic, sensual designs for both jewelry and hollow wear became, and truly they remain, go to Tiffany's today or look at their website, um, very popular. Her, her designs are really pretty classic. And then um, among her most uh, iconic pieces is the bone cuff bracelet shown on the right. I desperately wanted to try this on, but since it's in the collection, I wasn't able to. And she's wearing it too. As I mentioned, this section of the <coughs> exhibition, I was keen to include some costume jewelry, which became such an important aspect of American fashion during the Depression and the World War II eras, when women longed to be fashionable, but also frugal. And uh, here we have on the left a plastic um, necklace made of red Bakelite. I love that. Uh, the Kenneth J. Lane cuffs you've already seen, which are uh, copying Verdora and um, a metal and glass orchid necklace marked by Miriam Haskell, who, although not a designer herself, hired a very innovative designers to create affordable jewelry from high quality materials. Her firm attracted um, Hollywood stars as well, uh, as, as well as fashion um, conscious shoppers. Another firm that maintained a prominent presence in department stores was Trafari. I remember Trafari, and I grew up in Boston, near the Boston 
area, and I remember Trafari being sold in the big department stores. It was founded in New York in 1918 by Gustavo Trafari Sr. and Leo F. Cressman, and it became synonymous with high-style costume jewelry. And they also produced commission sets for Broadway stars and other uh, important clients, including First Lady Mamie Eisenhower, whose 1953 inaugural ball jewelry commissioned from Trafari, um, I'm showing you on the right. And uh, it's a three-strand necklace um, and uh, matching bracelet and earrings all made out of glass, glass pearls. Barbara Bush favored glass pearls, bigger ones, but um, hers were made by Kenneth J. Lane, who made the, the cuffs we saw. All right, I'm going to conclude with just two of the six contemporary jewelers that I f uh, featured in the exhibition. This is William Harper, Bill Harper, who employs very high carat gold, 22 carat often, um, cloisonne enamel, and uh, gemstones, as well as assemblage, assemblages of what he calls found objects, allied to his own collecting of African art. And this brooch on the right, he called, he titled Fabergé's Twins. I asked him what that meant. <coughs> It references, on the one hand, the exquisite, but what he sees as sterile Fabergé eggs made in the waning years of a decadent Russian court, and on the other hand, the dazzling gold created by the Ash Ashanti peoples of West Africa, um, as you see on the bottom. And it's large. It's um, over six inches tall. It's, it's a big piece. And finally, the late Daniel Brush, a prodigiously talented artist, uh, steeped in metallurgy uh, as well as in the history of art. Brush utilized such varying materials as pure gold, diamonds, and rubies, what we're used to, as well as plastic, aluminum, and steel. His work is amazing. Look him up. Um, but I'm showing you here an oversized interpretation of an ancient torque, which he transformed um, uh, from a piece, a dull piece of aluminum tubing that he sourced from producers of airplane refrigeration coils. So think of a, you know, a piece of aluminum tubing. He, in, he uh, engraved it overall, giving it this sort of frosted, dazzling skin. And uh, then he studded it with a myriad of multicolored diamonds, some new diamonds, some um, reused Mughal diamonds, and uh, thereby creating something at once rooted in tradition and utterly without precedent, uh, tickling history, he liked to say, and in the process, really redefining jewelry for 20th, 21st century America. I was able to try this on because it was still in his studio. So sometimes we get to have some fun. Well, this brings me to the end of our jewelry journey. I thank you so much for your attention, and I definitely encourage you, they're allowed to go visit. Yes, the exhibition, um, beautiful ex uh, exhibit of jewelry, um, and I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Thank you very much. <laughs> sure, if, if we have time, yes. Can we have some time for questions if anybody has any? Yes. I don't. That's hilarious. I think that's true. And you know those um, enam black enameled coach covers I showed you, those covers for diamonds? That was part of that feeling that you could wear them as black enameled, you know, um, blobs <laughs> all day, but then at night you could take off the cover and have your diamond showing. I always wanted to have said that, and I, Mary I, Queen of Scotland, it said there were three queens of, you know, with diamond engagement rings, and after that, it, things. Lose it, lightened up. I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> when you talk about acquisitions, are these pieces that you know exist somewhere that you're trying to get, or are they just gifted to you? It happens in so many different ways. Um, people come to you with the offer of a gift or to, to buy. You go around to the shops or watch the auctions and find things that are um, appropriate. And it, I mean, at the Met, it is. It's quite a pro I mean, it's not an act of parliament, but sometimes it feels like that. You know, I, so if I wanted to, let's say the, um, the uh, that plie cajour brooch with the conch, um, conch shell pearls, <clears throat> it was coming up for auction. A wonderful 
older woman who was a, a, a donor to the museum phoned me and said, Beth, do we need this? <laughs> I said, I think we need it. So I took it to my department head. She approved. Um, and then it had to go to the director to make sure the director approved. And then it was purchased. If it's an acquisition over a certain mo amount of money, the, um, and of course, this was coming as a gift, so it wasn't a problem. Uh, the Board of Trustees had to approve it. So, you know, all different ways. Sometimes you know a piece that you watch and hope it will come to you, but not always. Yeah. Oh, in the back. Usually glass, yeah. That early ring, I think, is also glass, but it's, yeah. Sometimes ancient or older jewelry uh, might have a piece of rock crystal. <laughs> Yes. Oh, that's, I'm sure. <clears throat> so that's like one that's, it's a lizard that's gold and enamel. Oh, got yeah. Jewels on it. A lot of really beautiful pieces. Bling, yeah. I mean, the Natural History Museums are a great source for um, the museum, the Natural American Museum of Natural History in New York. We did their um, jewelry gal, uh, the, <laughs> I think of it as jewelry, gems and minerals gallery. Um, yeah, it's beautiful, and there's a lot of jewelry in there too. Yeah. Yes. Do you by any chance go to the gala? The Met Gala? I wish. <laughs> you you have to be invited to that, um, and very little of the staff is invited. Yes, Anna Wintour oversees the guest list. <laughs> so no, I, I can, <clears throat> sometimes we're able to see the setup before it begins, but uh, no, unfortunately. I watch it on YouTube like everybody else. <laughs> well, Beth, thank you so much You're for being so with welcome. us. You're so welcome. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm like Belle. I'm, I'm, we're so glad you said yes. Oh my gosh, well, it's my pleasure. Hey.